Hello, and thank you all so much for joining me this evening. Thank you to BCH for hosting this lecture and allowing me the platform and the opportunity to share information about this topic. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about what I think every woman should know about screening mammograms. It's October, which means Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I know that it's a subject that can induce a lot of anxiety in many of us. Um, we in the breast imaging world know that most patients aren't particularly excited to see this date coming on their calendar. Uh, mammograms can certainly be awkward and uncomfortable, and of course, we're worried about the results and what they can show. Um, but today, I wanted to help at least address some of the most frequently asked questions I get about screening mammograms. Um, I want to sort of go over some of the facts and figures that confirm the importance of screenings. I want to share the current screening guidelines and recommendations with you. We'll talk a little bit about how you can best prepare for your screening mammogram and what exactly to expect. Um, whether you're about to have your first screening or your 30th, um, I want you to all get the most out of your screening mammogram. Okay, so I just want to start off by sharing a little bit about the history of mammograms because I think it's important to see how far we've come and the evolution. Um, the history of mammography really begins back in 1913 when a German surgeon, his name was Albert Salaman, uh, began x-raying specimens after mastectomies he performed. I think he performed something on the order of 3,000 mastectomies and he began to observe that there were some very specific radiologic appearances of breast cancers. In the 1950s, radiologists um, began using the breast compression technique um, to produce better quality images, something, as I'm sure you know, we continue to use to this day. The 1970s was really the beginning of the modern age of mammography with screen film mammography. And through the 70s and the 80s, we saw great improvements in mammographic technique as it continued to get better and better. National screening programs really began in the mid-80s. And in 1992, we saw uh, the important passage of something called the Mammography Quality of Standards Act, or the MQSA, as we call it. And that really brought the issues of patient safety and imaging quality to the forefront. So this act basically requires strict accreditation, certification, and inspection of all equipment and all personnel at any facility performing mammograms. The advent of digital mammography in the late 1990s to 2000s then allowed radiologists to start reading mammograms on computers rather than on films, uh, which leads us to the present day and the use of digital breast tomosynthesis, or so-called 3D mammography. And I'll talk a little bit more about exactly what that is a little later in the presentation. So it's really exciting to see um, how the technology has and continues to evolve. There's a lot of research currently on things like um, contrast enhanced mammography, and of course, the use of artificial intelligence, um, which I think will really help shape the future of mammography and breast cancer screenings. Okay, so let's get started with some frequently asked questions. First of all, why should I get a screening mammogram? Approximately 13% of women in the United States will be diagnosed with breast cancer sometime in their lives. So that means one in every eight women. And when you look at this little visual here and you imagine yourself standing there with seven of your family members or friends, I think you realize just what a big number that is. We know that breast cancer deaths have been reduced something on the order of 35 to 40% since the start of national screening mammograms in the late um, 1980s. Of course, that also goes hand in hand with improvements in breast cancer treatment, but screening mammograms have played a very large role in that reduction in deaths. Mammograms can detect breast cancers that are too small to be felt. So most masses are not felt until they're maybe about two centimeters, and that's already a stage two cancer. So with mammography, especially now with 3D mammograms, we're routinely catching cancers that are less than a centimeter, sometimes even less than five millimeters. And we know that breast cancers are more easily treated and, less li and more likely to be cured the smaller they are. Okay, who should get screening mammograms and how often? There are varying guidelines out there by different medical societies. Um, I just wanna emphasize the one point that they all agree on. Mammograms save lives. 
So the question of when exactly to start your screenings, how often to screen, is ultimately a personal decision, and one I think every patient should discuss with their provider. The recommendations that we support at BCH and as breast imagers are those of the Society of Breast Imaging, the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network, and the American College of Radiology. And that recommendation is annual screening mammograms beginning at the age of 40 and continuing as long as a patient is in good health. So what about those other screening guidelines? There are alternative guidelines out there, which I know can be a little confusing for patients and even for your doctors who are ordering your studies. The American Cancer Society recommends annual mammograms starting no later than the age of 45 with the option for women to start earlier at age 40. There is a group called the US Preventative Services Task Force. It's another organization and they have slightly differing guidelines which are a little controversial and are somewhat in opposition to the guidelines that I just shared. Um, this group recommends screening beginning at the age of 50 and continuing every other year until the age of 74. Um, I just want to emphasize that following these guidelines would miss approximately a third of cancers and would result in 6,500 to 10,000 additional breast cancer deaths a year. And that's precisely why um, the Affordable Care Act requires health insurers to pay for screening mammograms uh, with no out-of-pocket costs for all women starting at the age of 40. Okay, so why age 40? Uh, let me try to make a good case for why we recommend screenings beginning at age 40. First of all, one in six breast cancers occur in women age 40 to 49. The incidence is pretty low below the age of 30. It sort of moderately increases between 30 and 35, and there's a steady increase um, after the age of 40. 40% 40 of the years of life lost to breast cancer is among women in their 40s, and that's because, number one, they have more years to lose, and unfortunately, premenopausal cancers can end up um, sometimes being more aggressive and harder to catch early. So this is why every major health organization, including the American Cancer Society, um, agrees that starting annual mammograms at the age of 40 does save the most lives. The next question I get frequently is, when can I stop screening? And this is a question I got just the other week. Um, unfortunately, there are limited studies on the benefits of mammography over the age of 75. But we do know that breast cancer risk does continue to increase with age, and that screening continues to be effective in this population. So the American Cancer Society um, basically recommends that women ages 70 and older continue mammograms as long as they are in good health. So basically that means no major illnesses. They're gonna to expect to limit their lifespan five years or, or shorter. And also as long as the patient would actually seek treatment of cancer were it to be found. Of course, a sort of general rule of imaging is that it should only be done if the finding would actually affect treatment and management. Next frequently asked question, what is my breast cancer risk? This is a really important question. Um, I think there's a common misconception out there that if you don't have a family history, um, you're unlikely to get breast cancer. And the truth is that most breast cancers, about three quarters or 75% of women who get breast cancer have no family history or identifiable risk factors. Really, the biggest risk factors are simply being a female and increasing age. Nonetheless, I do recommend that all women have some type of risk assessment by the age of 30. So that means um, talking to both sides of your family about any history of breast cancers, any genetic syndromes, and actually calculating something called a lifetime breast cancer risk score. How do I know if I am high risk for breast cancer? There are certain factors that put women in that high risk category. Uh, those who carry the BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, the so-called breast cancer genes. Um, if you have a calculated lifetime breast cancer risk of 20% or higher, 
And again, that risk is calculated. Um, a number of factors go into it, including family history. So if you have a family history of a premenopausal breast cancer in a first degree relative, a mother or sister, then you are considered high risk. Also, any patient with a history of radiation to the chest before the age of 30, so that's typically gonna be young patients who've had some type of uh, radiation treatment for usually a Hodgkin's lymphoma. And there are also um, a wide number of genetic syndromes that we know are associated with breast cancer that put you in that high-risk category. So I recommend um, all patients by the age of 30 work with their providers and calculate that breast cancer risk score. There are a couple of different calculators out there that you can use. Um, they take into account, like I said, family history, genetics, um, estrogen exposure. I've linked two of the most common ones here. Um, the one that we use most commonly as breast radiologists is the bottom link here, and this is called the Tyra Cusick model, or the IBIS score. Um, those calculators were created for use by providers, so I would recommend that you work with your provider to, um, to come to that assessment. Okay, so then you calculate your score and you figure out your high risk. What should I do if I am high risk? If you are high risk, then screening guidelines do um, change a little bit for you. Uh, we generally recommend some baseline screening exam on high risk patients by the age of 30, or sometimes 10 years before the age of diagnosis of a first degree relative. Um, we generally do not screen before the age of 25. I would also say consider genetic counseling, especially if you know of genetic mutations in the family and you've never been tested. Um, if you are high risk, there are supplemental screening modalities that are recommended in conjunction with screening mammograms. And that's um, primarily gonna mean a high-risk screening breast MRI. Um, for those who are, who are unable to get an MRI, then a whole breast screening ultrasound is also an option. What about MRI and ultrasound? Um, I'd like to talk about this because I think many patients are wondering if these are better screening exams, then why wouldn't I just get these exams instead of a mammogram? Uh, first of all, MRI and ultrasound definitely have their uses, but they do not take the place of screening mammograms. They can be used really effectively, however, as supplements to screening, um, usually, like I said, for high-risk patients or patients with dense breasts. There are varying costs that are associated with uh, MRI and ultrasound, and they may be subject to co-pays and deductibles. There are also a higher um, level of false positives um, associated with these exams. MRI has the disadvantage of using gadolinium contrast, so you do need IV access uh, for that contrast during your exam. Whole breast screening may be a a whole breast screening ultrasound could be a good option for patients who can't have MRI, um, usually because they have a non-compatible device, or for average risk women who want something to sort of supplement their uh, annual mammograms. The nice thing about ultrasound is that it doesn't use radiation or compression, and it's usually pretty well tolerated by patients. There are different type of screening ultrasounds that are offered um, nationwide, some automated options at some facilities, uh, here at BCH, our very experienced ultrasound technologists uh, perform handheld whole breast screening ultrasound. Okay, a very important question. Should I have a screening or a diagnostic mammogram? So here are the key differences. Um, a screening mammogram is an exam performed annually for women 40 and older, and it's meant to be performed in patients who have no symptoms. Um, it's covered by insurance, as we talked about, under the ACA. There are standard images, usually two basic views um, of each breast that come with the screening, and these studies are viewed by the radiologist sometime after the exam. Now, a diagnostic mammogram is performed in symptomatic patients or as a follow-up to abnormal screening exam. And a diagnostic mammogram can be performed in women or men of any age who are having breast symptoms, um, although we don't typically routinely perform mammograms in patients younger than 30. 
<clears throat> Diagnostic mammograms aren't necessarily covered by insurance. There's usually some copay or deductible with these exams. It's possible that we'll start with the exact same views as you would get with a screening mammogram. Um, but with the diagnostics exam, we have the flexibility to add additional views as needed to go to an ultrasound if needed. And these exams are read in real time by the radiologist, so you would receive the results of that exam um, and any follow-up recommendations before leaving. Okay, since I mentioned that screening mammograms are meant for asymptomatic patients, let's just go over what some of the signs and symptoms of breast cancer are. If you're, if you're experiencing a new lump either in the breast or under the arm, um, new breast or nipple pain, particularly persistent or focal pain, um, any new nipple changes, things like nipple retraction, nipple, new nipple discharge, um, specifically clear or bloody nipple discharge, any skin changes like skin thickening or dimpling, then screening mammogram is probably not going to be appropriate for you. You should be getting a diagnostic mammogram. And this is really, really important. Um, it's the reason why the technologist asks at every screening appointment if you're experiencing any new symptoms. Unfortunately, we have had patients um, who have known that they had a new lump, but chosen to continue with the screening mammogram. And when they're told their screening is normal, they felt they could ignore the lump and ended up with a delayed diagnosis of a cancer that almost certainly would have been seen on a diagnostic exam. As we'll talk about a little later, um, screening mammograms are not perfect. And when you have something like a new lump in the breast, it's really, really important that the radiologist has that information when they're looking at the images to just make sure that nothing subtle is missed. Okay, so if you are symptom-free and ready to schedule your routine screening mammogram, the next question is, what can I expect during my screening exam? So typically, we do two standard views of each breast during screening. They're called the medial lateral oblique, or MLO view. That's the images here on the left. And the cranial caudal, or the CC view. And these are the images on the right. So this is kind of like a bird's eye view of the breast. Um, you see this is the inner breast here, and this is the outer breast here. Uh, these are the views required in every screening mammogram. Um, if you have you know, very large breasts, it's possible that um, we may need additional images, things like exaggerated views or cleavage views, just to make sure that we get a good look at all that tissue. Um, sometimes images do need to be repeated by the technologist. If there's excessive motion or if there's artifact um, obscuring the breast tissue, for example, this is an example of a skin fold, and sometimes if that's right in the middle of the breast, it obscures our um, vision of that, of that tissue. Um, or sometimes if the nipple is too off profile, here you can see this, is the, this little density here is the nipple, and you can imagine if, if that was you know, really rolled, um, you could confuse that for a mass in the breast. Why is compression important? I know nobody likes compression, but it really is so, so important. It spreads out that dense breast tissue, so we have a better chance of seeing you know, those little masses and small findings and you have a less of a chance of getting called back for findings like overlapping tissue. Compression also helps prevent motion, and it actually reduces the radiation dose to you. So the better we're able to compress, the better for everyone. Um, I know some women really, really struggle with the discomfort of compression. So here are just a few tips to help minimize pain. First of all, I would recommend that you try to um, avoid scheduling your mammogram in that period one week um, prior to or during your menstrual cycle. And that tends to be when the breasts are most tender and most sensitive. Make sure you communicate with your technologist during the exam. Their goal is, of course, to get the best images possible, but um, they'll only compress to your tolerance. So please communicate with them. And finally, um, if you know you always have significant pain with compression, then uh, consider taking a pain reliever. You can take aspirin, Tylenol, or ibuprofen about 45 to 60 minutes before your exam, and that might help lessen that discomfort. 
Um, I just wanted to include a little example here. This is a um, patient who was called back for this little spot here on their mammogram in the left inner breast. Um, the patient was very tender on the day of screening and wasn't able to tolerate much compression. She returned to us a couple of weeks later here uh, for diagnostic imaging, and we were able to use twice the compression, uh, and voila, that tissue spreads out nicely and that spot disappears. So, you know, we would really love for every screening mammogram to look like this one every time, so we can avoid calling you back if, if not needed, and, and that's, you know, just one of the reasons why compression is really important. Next question, oops. Is the radiation from mammograms harmful? Okay, so the risk of causing breast cancer from radiation from mammograms is far, far lower than the likelihood of mammograms detecting a breast cancer for a woman ages 40 and older. Mammograms do use low-dose radiation, but they're all within safe levels as um, determined by the FDA. The typical radiation dose is about 0.4 millisieverts. So just for reference, the amount of background radiation you receive just by living in Boulder is approximately five to six millisieverts a year. So you really receive just a fraction of that with a mammogram. Okay, here are just a few more tips and how you can best prepare for your screening mammogram. Number one, know the places and dates of prior mammograms, biopsies, or other breast procedures. Uh, my recommendation is that you write down the date and location of every single mammogram you have. You may move to a different stage, you might go to a different screening facility, and the ability to track down those prior mammo mammograms is really, really important. Uh, you have a higher chance of being called back uh, on your first mammogram, which we call the baseline exam. And because it's our first time seeing your breast um, and establishing what is normal, that's, you know, that's to be expected. If we have no mammograms for comparison, we're basically getting a new baseline on you. So if you have any prior exams, whether it was done two years ago or seven years ago, it's really helpful for the radiologists to see that. Um, it might mean the difference of being called back or not. Number two, Know your family history, especially history of breast cancers and gynecologic cancers. Know the dates of any recent vaccinations, especially, or, and which arm it was administered to. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the COVID vaccination um, and screening a little bit later here in the presentation. Also, don't use any deodorants, um, antiperspirants, creams, or lotions on the breast or under the arms. Um, they can have an appearance on mammogram that kind of um, can be confused for worrisome findings. So avoid all those. And if you are breastfeeding, make sure to pump or feed immediately before the mammogram to help clear out those milk ducts and make sure we get the clearest images possible. Another question I get often, what is 3D mammography? So we use a technology called digital breast tomosynthesis or DBT. And basically, it's multiple 2D images that are reconstructed into really, really thin one millimeter slices to create so-called 3D images. And it really um, has helped improve the uh, detection of breast cancers and, increase the, and decrease the need for callbacks and biopsies. So here's an example of a 2D image here. Um, <clears throat> versus a tomosynthesis image here. And you can see how this very, very subtle little mass here is so much better visualized on the tomosynthesis views. So tomo is rapidly replacing traditional 2D mammograms. I think it's about 70% of breast imaging uh, centers now use this technology. Um, some facilities still do use a mix of 2D and 3D machines. Um, sometimes they perform tomo on, breast, on patients who have dense breasts or risk factors. Here at BCH, every single screening mammogram is performed with tomosynthesis, so you do not have to request it. It does not have to be a special order from your doctor. If you come here, you'll be certain that you do get 3D mammograms. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the risks and limitations of mammograms. 
we know screening mammograms are not perfect. Um, overall, the sensitivity is about 87 to 93%. For anyone who's been called back from a screening, you know that there are false positives sometimes, meaning that you have an abnormal screening, but you know, after all the workup, it turns out to not be a cancer. And sometimes it does lead to benign biopsies. We know, we recognize that that creates a lot of anxiety in patients to be called back. Um, as breast radiologists, I just want you to know we agonize over our callbacks, or at least I do. And, you know, the number of cases we call back are regulated and tracked to make sure that they are appropriate and within the norm. There's also some concern that mammograms can contribute to something called overdiagnosis, and that's when we, we basically discover a cancer, um, and maybe that cancer is very low grade, and had it gone undetected, maybe it would not have caused any real harm to the patient. Well, the important thing to note is that while some cancers are not as harmful as others, um, simply due to their biology, there's really no way of knowing when and whether a cancer will progress. So really, all detected cancers are generally treated. Screening mammograms also have um, decreased sensitivity in dense breasts, and we'll talk all about breast density in just a moment here. Um, sometimes there are cancers that are nearly impossible to see by mammogram, even when we know that they are there. So we refer to these as mammographically occult cancers. Um, you know, but despite all these limitations, mammography does remain the gold standard for early stage breast cancer detection. And it's really the only modality proven to reduce mortality from breast cancer. <clears throat> okay, um, let's talk a little bit now about how to read your mammogram report. I know many of you are seeing your own reports um, on your patient portal. Here's an example of a standard report here on the right. Uh, mammography reports are highly standardized here in the United States. Um, so they'll look pretty similar wherever you go. Um, you have a clinical history, and that includes any family history or prior breast procedures or biopsies, comparison studies, breast composition, or so-called breast density findings, impression, um, BIRADS category, and recommendations for follow-up. And we'll go over a few of these in a little bit of greater detail here. <clears throat> First of all, what is breast composition? So this is something that's included in every screening mammogram report. And it's basically a radiologic assessment of breast density. It is not, however, a measure of how dense the breast feels to you. Um, sometimes it does correlate with how they feel, but sometimes it doesn't. So breasts are basically made up of three types of tissue, fibrous, glandular, and fatty tissue. And density is basically a reflection of the proportion of fibrous tissue to fatty tissue. It does change with certain factors. Um, most patients tend to get less dense with age. It can also be affected by pregnancy or breastfeeding, hormone replacement therapy, weight changes, and of course genetic factors play a big role as well. Um, if you read your mammogram report and discover that you have dense breasts, you are not alone. Approximately 50% of women fall into the categories of heterogeneously dense and extremely dense breasts. So here, are the four different breast densities and how they appear on your mammogram. Dense tissue is basically the white on the mammogram, and fatty tissue is sort of the dark um, gray or black tissue here. So here we have a type A on the left, um, almost entirely fatty, and this is gonna be about 10% of women. Type B is scattered areas of fibroglandular density. Um, this is about 40% of women. Type C is heterogeneously dense, and that's another 40%. And type D here on the far right is extremely dense, and that makes up about 10% of women. Why does breast density matter? So as you can imagine, um, really dense breast tissue can hide small cancers. It's the polar bear in a snowstorm analogy I've used before. Um, 
dense breast tissue is wide on the mammograms, and so is cancer. So small tumors can be missed in the dense breast. Uh, it's also, um, density is also an independent um, risk factor for breast cancers. And that is why there are laws in most states, including Colorado, requiring that women with dense breasts be notified um, by, um, by a letter um, that they have dense breasts so that they can choose to undergo supplemental screening tests if they want to. And um, that's usually going to mean a screening whole breast ultrasound for patients who are average risk or breast MRI for those higher risk women. Okay, let's talk about the actual findings on your mammogram report and what they mean. Um, I promise you, it's not our goal as radiologists to use unfamiliar and confusing words in your mammogram reports. It's, you know, especially we know that you're reading your, your reports. And like I mentioned, mammography is a very, very highly regulated field. Um, breast radiologists um, follow something called the BIRADS, which it's um, it basically provides standardized terminology to describe breast imaging findings. This was really created to improve the quality of breast imaging so that, you know, no matter where in the country you go for a mammogram, the findings are described in a, in a standardized way. So any radiologist looking at follow-up studies know exactly what the findings are, what the next steps are. Um, I'm going to give you all a little crash course here on breast radiology. Uh, these are examples of the four most typical findings that we see on mammograms. You will very likely see these words in your report, and I want you to have some idea of what they mean. The first is something called an asymmetry. And just like it sounds, it just means an asymmetric area of tissue. Uh, let me just get my cursor here. Um, it can be as subtle as this little area right here. Um, a little density we see on one side of the breast and not the other. Um, this could just represent a little area of overlapping tissue, uh, kind of like the example I showed you before. Um, or it could be um, the sign of a developing mass or a cancer. Again, it just really emphasizes the importance of having comparison mammograms if possible. Okay, the second descriptor is a mass. And a mass describes something that's usually seen on two views, and it has contours suggesting that it's very unlikely to just be overlapping tissue. Um, there are both benign or non-cancerous masses and malignant masses that occur in the breast. Um, benign masses being, for example, cysts or fibroadenomas. This oval mass we see here in this one happens to be a benign cyst. Um, and sometimes we do need to go to ultrasound to further um, distinguish that. Um, next, we have the finding of microcalcifications, which are basically little calcium de deposits in the breast. And they show up on mammograms as these little white dots. And again, many, many benign causes of microcalcifications um, some of the more common causes being fibrocystic breasts and benign masses like cysts and fibroadenomas. But when they have a specific appearance, they can be indicative of an early form of a stage zero breast cancer or ductal carcinoma in situ, DCIS is what we call it. And that's why we sometimes call back this finding to better get a better look at those calcifications with magnified views. Okay, finally, one of the trickier findings we see here is on the very right, something we call architectural distortion. And this is the area I'm looking at right here. Um, this is a finding where we don't necessarily see a mass, um, but the tissue looks just a little bit distorted, like it's kind of being pulled by something at the center here, um, if you can appreciate that. Um, again, there are benign causes of this appearance on mammogram. Some of the more common things being post-surgical changes or something, a benign a finding we call a radial scar or complex sclerosing lesion. But it can also be the way a breast cancer presents as your breast tissue is sort of trying to contain a tumor. So what is the BIRAD score? And again, this is something that's required to be included in every single mammogram report. So BIRADS stands for Breast Imaging 
reporting and database system. And here is our trusty Byrad's Atlas, just 637 pages of pure reading joy here. Uh, the Byrad's scoring system is one the radiologist uses to describe the overall results of the mammogram. It goes from zero to six, and on a screening mammogram report, the only possible categories that you'll see are zero, one, or two. So a zero means an incomplete exam. So basically, it means that there's some finding that requires additional imaging evaluation, um, or as we call it, a callback. It all, may also mean that a comparison exam is needed. Um, sometimes, you know, we're working on getting those prior exams, so we may give it a zero, um, saying we need to compare it to prior exams. Rarely, we will also give a zero for a technical callback, and that's if the images, for whatever reason, are not technically adequate. A BIRADS category one is a normal negative exam. A BIRADS category two is also a normal exam, but sometimes there's just a benign finding that we want to describe in the report, something like post-surgical changes or a benign mass or benign calcifications, and so we can give that a BIRADS two. The other categories, three through six, are ones that we use after um, a diagnostic exam. So you won't see that on a screening report. BIRADS 3 is what we call a probably benign finding, and that usually requires some type of a short-term follow-up study. BIRADS 4 and 5 are used to describe suspicious or highly suspicious findings that then uh, require biopsy. And a BIRADS 6 is the category that we give to biopsy-proven cancers. So again, on a screening mammogram, the things to look out for, um, you will only see BIRAD 0, 1, or 2. 1 and 2 means normal exam, and BIRAD 0 means we need some type of additional imaging to make a final assessment. What happens after a screening mammogram? Um, just to kind of give you an idea. Many women will be called back from a screening mammogram at some point in their lives um, out of every 100 women who get a screening, about 90 will be told that their mammograms are normal by RADS 1 or 2. Approximately 10 of those 100 women will be given a by RADS 0 and asked to return for additional images, um, either a diagnostic mammogram or ultrasound or both. Of those 10 women called back, around six of those women will then be reassured that the additional imaging cleared the finding and the findings are normal kind of like that case I showed you where the little asymmetry went away on the additional view. Um, two of those 10 called back will then be asked to return in six months for a follow-up exam. And those are the BIRADS three, um, quote unquote, probably benign findings. And out of the 10 women called back from the 100, approximately two women will then be recommended to proceed with some type of a needle biopsy for a suspicious finding. So, as you can see, it's not a perfect system. Um, there will be things seen on mammograms occasionally that end up being nothing. And I know there's a lot of anxiety if you are one of those 10 patients called back. But um, it is part of the process in finding those cancers. And I just want you to know that most patients who get called back will be reassured that their exam is benign. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go over briefly some frequently asked questions about sort of special screening uh, scenarios. First of all, what if I have breast implants? So patients with implants have the same screening guidelines. There's no increase in breast cancer risk with implants. And if you've ever wondered what implants look like on mammograms, here you go. Um, here are MLO views of the breast with silicone implants. Um, and as you can see, they're pretty opaque, meaning we can't see much through those implants. Um, that's why we perform additional views. Um, they're called implant displacement views on implant patients. So for these patients, there will be a total of four images taken of each breast rather than two. Um, rupture, that's a question I get frequently, very, very unlikely. Um, in fact, I've never personally seen an implant rupture as a result of a screening mammogram. And I promise you that our technologists are very, very skilled at positioning implants. 
Unfortunately, even with those implant displaced views that we get, some breast tissue is likely to be obscured with implants, and so it does decrease the sensitivity of mammograms a little bit. And another question I do receive is how long after implants um, can I get a screening mammogram? So how long after the implants have been placed? Um, I recommend checking with your surgeon to see their preferences, but we usually advise no sooner than six months after surgery. Next question, what if I am pregnant or breastfeeding? And again, I recognize that this is gonna be a very personal decision for many patients. Uh, I just want to share that pregnancy-associated breast cancers have an incidence of about one in 3,000 to 10,000 pregnancies. Uh, unfortunately, this is a population where breast cancers can be missed because patients have chosen to forego screening during that period. Um, so especially if you are planning to breastfeed for an extended period of time, or if you're a high-risk patient, I highly recommend you talk to your doctor about how to continue your screening mammograms during this period. Mammogram, mamm mammography is not actually contraindicated in pregnancy or lactation. It can be performed safely if appropriate. So the fetal radiation dose is less than 0.03 milligrays. Um, Studies have shown no negative impact to a fetus for radiation doses below uh, 50 milligrays. So we are far, far below that level. The breasts do generally have increased density um, you know, during pregnancy and lactation. That's because all those ducts and lobules are expanding and there's increased vascularity to the breast. Um, so again, I do recommend pumping or feeding um, immediately before a mammogram to sort of get the clearest images possible. What are screening guidelines for transgender patients? So there is limited data um, here, and you know these guidelines are still evolving and emerging, but there's something that we use called the American College of Radiology Appropriateness Criteria, and these are evidence-based guidelines, and they basically categorize imaging exams into three groups, usually appropriate, may be appropriate, and usually not appropriate. Um, the ACR has recognized certain scenarios in which screening mammograms are usually appropriate um, for transgender patients. And this includes male to female patients with hormone use five years or greater, high risk male to female patients, and female to male patients um, ages 40 and older who have some breast tissue remaining. So either no chest surgery or some breast, breast reduction surgery. And you know, I've, I've included a link here to Komen.org. Um, they have a really, really nice summary of screening re uh, recommendations for all patients, including transgender patients. Okay. This is a question I'm getting a lot more recently um, as patients are getting their boosters. Should I delay a screening mammogram due to COVID vaccination? So vac vaccine-induced adenopathy, or swollen lymph nodes as a result of a vaccine, um, are a reported side effect of the COVID vaccinations, all brands. Um, and sometimes those lymph nodes are seen on your screening mammogram. So the Society of Breast Imaging recommends no longer delaying um, screening mammograms due to vaccinations. So this is a change from those recommendations that we had previously that you know, came out when we first started vaccinating. It is still possible that some type of follow-up imaging might be recommended um, if we do see this finding on your screening. The really important thing is that you notify your technologist of any recent vaccination, and very importantly, which arm you got that uh, vaccination in. Um, you know, that information then gets com communicated to the radiologist and they'll take that into account when they're reading your examination. Okay, so. Those are the answers to some of the most frequently asked questions that I have received. I know I covered a very, very wide range of topics there. Um, I do believe that knowledge is power, and I hope that something in this presentation can be useful to you in your breast uh, health journey. I have a checklist here of items I'd like to challenge every patient to go through during this month, um, during Breast Cancer Awareness. First of all, if you haven't done it already, I recommend <clears throat> calculating or working with your doctor to calculate that lifetime breast cancer risk score. Second, learn your breast density. 
look at your mammogram report and find that out. And remember that it doesn't necessarily correlate to how dense you think your breasts feel. Talk to your provider about the best screening recommendations for you. And just remember that evidence has shown that annual screening mammograms beginning at the age of 40 saves the most lives. Um, talk to your doctor about any new breast symptoms. Um, make sure that you're not going in for a screening mammogram if a diagnostic mammogram is more appropriate. And schedule your annual screening mammograms. You know, whether it's been exactly a year or five years since your last screening, we are not there to judge you. We just want every woman to have the best chance possible to catch those cancers when they're small and treatable. So here is the number you can call to schedule your screening mammogram. If you are asymptomatic, age 40 or older, you do not need an order from a doctor um, to schedule. You can self-schedule. BCH offers three locations, the Foothills Hospital in Boulder, where we also offer Saturday appointments, Community Medical Center in Lafayette, and Erie Medical Center in Erie, where we have many available appointments. I think we have available appointments as soon as this week. So all of our locations are designated ACR, Breast Imaging Centers of Excellence. And I just want to take a moment to thank all the amazing tech MAMO technologists out there, especially our technologists at BCH. I might be a little biased, but I just think they're the greatest, and I know they will take such good care of you. Um, here are some great resources if you'd like some further information about the things I talked about tonight. And finally, I'd like to just share a little four-minute video. This was produced by the Society of Breast Imaging, and it really reiterates many of the things we discussed tonight. So. I hope you'll all take this information to heart, um, share it with friends and family. This is Lisa. Lisa is celebrating her 40th birthday today, surrounded by family and friends. Today is all about cake and balloons, but tomorrow she'll be thinking about her health. At her last checkup, Lisa's OBGYN, Dr. Suarez, recommended that when she turned 40, she should start getting regular mammography screenings to test for breast cancer. Breast cancer is the most commonly occurring non-skin cancer in American women, and the second leading cause of cancer deaths among American women of all ages. There are several methods for detecting breast cancer. Self-examination, clinical breast exam, mammography, ultrasound, or MRIs. But mammography is the only screening tool proven to reduce the rate of death from breast cancer. Breast cancer deaths are decreased by approximately 30% among women who get screened with mammography. On her way to meet her best friend for coffee, Lisa is thinking about all the new information she learned from Dr. Suarez. In 2015, doctors are anticipating over 230,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer. She also learned that 21% of all breast cancers occur in women younger than 50. Lisa meets her friend Aisha at the cafe and discusses what she learned from her doctor. Some women are at higher risk of breast cancer, including those with a family history of the disease. But Aisha's doctor said that 75% of women diagnosed with breast cancer don't have any high risk factors. That means that everyone needs to be screened early and regularly. Lisa heads home to have dinner with her brother Derek, a medical student. Lisa's still on the fence about scheduling a mammogram, and she has three major concerns. She is worried that the radiation exposure could do more harm than good. She doesn't know how she would handle a false positive result, which would mean more tests and she knows that overdiagnosis is a concern, meaning that they could find something that if left untreated would never have hurt her in the first place. Over dinner, Derek explained what he had learned in medical school, that these risks have largely been disproven. He tells his sister that there's no measurable radiation risk for a woman her age, and the risk continues to go down the older she gets. He also read a study that showed that 63% of women would accept 500 false positives if it meant one life was saved. Lastly, the overdiagnosis claim has largely been discredited. 
It has been shown that screenings actually reduce the rate of invasive cancers in women. Opponents of screenings argue that mammography screenings are inconvenient and can cause anxiety in women. But Derek convinced his sister that no test was more inconvenient than undetected breast cancer that led to death. Derek said that each year there are now more than 30% fewer deaths from breast cancer than would have occurred had screening not been introduced. After talking it over with Dr. Suarez, Aisha, and Derek, and after reading up on breast cancer information, Lisa scheduled a mammography screening. At the appointment, the technologist gave Lisa advice to share with her friends. All women should have regular mammography screenings at age 40. And for women at high risk, earlier or supplemental screening may be appropriate. Mammography screening isn't perfect. It doesn't find every woman's cancer. And sometimes it's already too late to prevent a death. Its role is to detect breast cancer early, before it has a chance to spread. Each year, regular screening with mammography saves 15 to 20,000 lives in the USA. All major health organizations agree that the most lives are saved by screenings beginning at the age of 40. Get screened early and get checked regularly. To learn more about mammography screenings and the information and statistics featured here, please visit the Society of Breast Imaging's website. This is Lisa. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you all so much for your attention this evening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Ooh, I'm a little loud on this mic. So um, we do have a few questions, and we have a few minutes uh, left to take them in. So uh, the first question is, so are screening recommendations any different for those who have had breast cancer? Okay, that, that's a really great question. Um, so if you have had a breast cancer and had breast conservation surgery, so a lumpectomy, um, then usually what we do is a new baseline mammogram somewhere between six to 12 months after your surgery. After that, the recommendation um, is annual mammograms. Whether you do that as a screening mammogram or a diagnostic mammogram is um, sometimes based on patient preference or provider preference, but it is annual mammography that's the recommendation. Now, if you have had a breast cancer diagnosed um, you know, before the age of 50, or if you have dense breasts and have had a breast cancer, then uh, the recommendation is that you also consider breast MRI as a supplement to mammograms. Um, I can say that, you know, as an imager, it's one of the greatest things that we see every day are nice, normal screening mammograms from patients who are 10, 20, 30 years post lumpectomy. If you have had mastectomies, um, then we don't do routine mammograms after mastectomy. Um, but if you have a specific problem after a mastectomy, like a new lump or an area of concern, then we do diagnostic exams. So we could do a diagnostic ultrasound or a diagnostic MRI for, for those patients. Great question. Great, great. Are there any lifestyle modifications that can change breast density? Uh, I wish. <laughs> I think mean, you know, a lot of patients wonder about that. Um, as I kind of mentioned, the two main factors are pretty non-modifiable, and that's going to be, you know, uh, sort of genetics and age. So, um, you know, actually, uh, weight loss increases the appearance of density on mammograms. Um, not that I'm advising against weight loss, if that's appropriate for you, but um, that's, it doesn't correlate, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, I guess, you know, really the importance of density is just being aware of anything that might change the appearance of the density on your mammograms from year to year. So the, you know, hormone replacement therapy, breastfeeding, lactation, uh, major weight loss or weight changes, um, you know, those are just things that are very important to notify your technologist of so that we can take that in consideration when we're reading your mammograms. 
This viewer says, I get called back from my screening mammograms all of the time. Is there anything I can do differently so I don't get called back so often? Yes, I mean, you know, yes, I hear that very often and I know nobody wants to be called back. I don't want to be called back. Um, so really the most important things, um, first one is like I mentioned in, in my presentation, is, is obtaining those prior mammograms. Even if it's just one mammogram you had five years ago, um, it just really helps to see that prior uh, study and, you know, and it, it can save you from that callback. Also, um, you know, again, just working with your technologists um, to get the best images possible. So, you know, letting them sort of pull and position and compress. Um, if you can tolerate, you know, we're not trying to torture you, I promise, but if you can tolerate that discomfort for that short period, you know, those technologists know exactly what they need to do to get those best images possible for the radiologists to review. So um, just, you know, doing your best to uh, sort of work with the technologist um, during that day is also really important. Thank you. Uh, this uh, viewer says, if they find lumps through a mammogram and then a diagnostic ultrasound, how long should you wait to get a second ultrasound to see growth? I'm sorry, I missed the second part of that. How um, long? If they find lumps through a mammogram mm -hmm. and then a diagnostic ultrasound, how long should you wait to get a second ultrasound to see growth? To see? Growth. Oh, growth. Okay. Okay. So... If a mass is seen on a screening mammogram and we bring you back for a diagnostic ultrasound, there's a few different possible outcomes of that. If it looks completely benign on the ultrasound, like a simple cyst, then you just go right back to the screening pool. If you have a mass that, um, you know, that fits criteria that we call probably benign, and so these are usually gonna be like the well-circumscribed masses, um, typically fibroadenomas, then sometimes we will recommend a six-month follow-up. So that's the BIRADS category three that I talked about in the presentation, and that's usually a six-month interval that we'll recheck it to see if there's any changes. And we may continue to, find, continue to follow that finding for a period of up to two years before we call it benign. Um, the other possible outcome, of course, is that something is found on ultrasound that looks suspicious, in which case we would recommend a tissue biopsy, a core needle biopsy. Um, you know, just so that you know if, you know, if there is a finding that kind of falls into that probably benign category, um, it's still possible that we can sample it if, if that's your preference. Um, you know, we kind of go by the guidelines of recommending biopsy when something is suspicious, but um, occasionally we do biopsy probably benign findings when a patient wants to know definitively what that, what that lesion is. Thank you. My mammogram report says I have a vascular calcification in my breast. Is, the, is that different from other calcifications, and is that something I should be concerned about? Yes, um, good question. So vascular calcifications in the breast have nothing to do with breast cancer. Um, they're basically calcifications that are in the walls of the arteries of the breasts. And actually, technically, as radiologists, we're not required to even really mention them if, they're, if we think that they're non-worrisome or benign. But more recently, there's been a trend um, to include that in the report. And the reason for that is that um, studies have shown that there is a, a strong correlation between vascular calcifications in the breast and cardiovascular disease um, and coronary artery diseases. So it's really a way to sort of risk stratify a population. You know, um, most screening, most women ages 40 and older are getting annual mammograms. And so, you know, it's a way to sort of, um, uh, you know, identify maybe some patients who might be at higher risk for those cardiovascular diseases and, um, you know, get some early screening on those patients. So that's why that is um, oftentimes included in the report, even though it's a benign finding. Great. We have time for a couple of more questions. Um, so let's see if we can get through them in our few minutes remaining here. I've been reading about molecular breast imaging and would like to know more about it. 
Okay, so that's, it's not my specific area of um, expertise, but it is one of the emerging, you know, uh, areas of breast imaging and that we're developing. Um, it's not to a point where it's recommended for the general population, so I don't want to kind of go too into detail about it, but, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things, I think, coming down the pipeline, and if they prove to be effective, then we'll see, start to see them um, in general screening uh, recommendations. Great. Is there an age after which screening should can be discontinued? I think you taught you. I did, that. and I'm happy to um, to just kind of go over that again because I know people want a hard answer. I know they want a, a number, and unfortunately, there isn't one. Um, again, we kind of go by American Cancer Society um, and Society of Breast Imaging that suggests that patients ages 70 and older um, continue mammograms as long as they are generally in good health. So, um, you know, no major illnesses um, that are sort of limiting uh, the life expectancy. And as long as they are willing to pursue treatment, which is um, typically going to be surgery, it, if a breast cancer is to be found. And I think we have time for one more. I have extremely dense breasts and get 3D mammogram annually. Should I get ultrasound screenings annually as well? And are, are they covered by Medicare? Um, they are not, so they are not covered in the way that a screening mammogram is covered, which is, um, you know, 100% coverage with no out-of-pocket costs for, the, for women over age 40. Um, it is suggested that you consider, if you have extremely dense breasts, um, supplementing mammograms with a whole breast screening ultrasound. And that's something to discuss with your provider because, like I said, there are some risks, associate, risks and downsides associated with that, cost being one of them, you know, the possibility of, you know, false positive findings. Um, in, studies have shown that they can help um, increase the overall cancer detection rate when used in conjunction with mammograms. All righty. If you have dense breasts and breast cancer is prevalent in your mother's family, can you get an ultrasound paid for by insurance? Uh, that, it's going to be... Um, a question to take with your insurance company because I think that different companies vary. Um, generally, though, if you do meet that 20% or higher breast cancer risk, there is increased coverage for you for those breast MRIs and the ultrasound studies. 